Um, I want to uh, um, int introduce our featured speaker today. I had the opportunity to um, have dinner with Adora Svitek and her mother Joyce last night, and uh, we just had a great time. And um, one of the great things about having Adora here today is that oftentimes we make plans for tomorrow without conferring with the next generation of learners that can impact not only what we do, but how we do it. Today we'll have a unique opportunity to hear from a young person's perspective on education, learning experiences, and how to excite students in the classroom. Adora is a 12-year-old author and teacher. She's been, teaching and she's been teaching writing workshops since she published her first book at age seven. She teaches every day through school visits and distance learning medium, mediums such as webcasting and video conferencing. Adora has been featured on Oprah, CNN's Young People Who Rock, NBC's Nightly News, and countless other programs. Like most children and young adults, she has thoughts about what she wants to be when she grows up. Yeah, <laughs> because seven, just publishing a book wasn't quite enough. Um, only Adora aspires to be a journalist, historian, humanitarian, principal, teacher, and when she's done with all that, um, a talk show hostess. <laughs> uh, in addition to her short list of aspirations, her greatest ambitions are to win the Nobel Prizes for Literature and for Peace. Ladies and gentlemen, and gentlemen, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Adora Svitek. Come on up, Adora. Hello, everybody. It's so great to see you all today. Uh, I hope that my short stature isn't indicative of the height of the importance of this conference. I am about almost five feet, I think. I would like to thank everybody who made this possible because my short height is really a reflection on the vision of the people who organized this conference. So I would like to thank everyone at Ohio E-Tech for making this possible, thank you. Many conferences I've been to have needed some more convincing first. No, actually I didn't use any uh, brute power to do that. Unfortunately, I don't have quite enough. Now, today I'm going to be kind of turning you into teenagers by having you multitask with the devices that I'm hoping you have. Does anyone here have a cell phone or a laptop on them? Stand if you have a cell phone or a laptop. Or you can raise your hand, that's fine. Okay, I'm seeing some raised hands. Great, you're kind of creating a wave, like going up and down. So today, uh, we're actually going to be using a few different things. Uh, I'll have, um, connect to Wi-Fi, please. If any of you have your cell phones and laptops with you, if you could connect to the internet. And the reason that I'm having you do this is because on my Twitter account, I have a link which you should go to, and at the end of the session, you'll be able to type in all of your questions, and throughout the session, I'll answer those at the end. And actually, for every new follower on my Twitter, I will be donating one penny to the uh, Haiti relief effort. And then at the end of the session, I'm taking care of business here, you will also have a chance to win a copy of either of my autographed books, Flying Fingers or Dancing Fingers. So I was so excited to come to Ohio because it's completing my tour of the kind of Great Lakes area. So I actually come from Washington State. Is there anyone here from Washington State? Raise your hand if you're from Washington State. I'm really lonely right here. Yes, you're from Washington, hooray! I don't have to be the lone Washingtonian. So Washington is really nice. It's a little bit warmer than Columbus, but I'm excited to come here uh, because I've been to some other areas. I've been to Wisconsin, Milwaukee, uh, Chicago, Indianapolis, so coming down, it sort of makes sense. And if you'll take a look at a map, this is kind of my route going right into Columbus for the geographically challenged of you. I'm hoping that includes nobody. There's a map. 
Now there's only a minute 28 states to go if I finish all of them. I've actually visited Florida quite recently, but much as I tried, I wasn't able to drop it over Lake Michigan. Now whenever I speak to an audience of people, I like to know what positions you have, what you do. Uh, and so this helps me know which of my jokes will be offensive and which will be tolerable. I wanted to think of a creative way for you guys to share with me. And my dad was like, you know what, or maybe do you want to be a little more serious when you're starting out? Uh, and I know that you guys are really professional people, but I thought, well, here's your chance to be kind of a kid for a day and do a little bit of standing and shouting, just to give you warning. So if you are a librarian or media specialist, do we have any librarians or media specialists in the room? Please stand up and shout, E! E, -E. Yay! Great, if you are a technology coordinator, coach, or director, stand up and shout, Tech! <laughs> Great! If you are an administrator, stand up and shout, O! If you are someone I have not, oh, sorry. If you are a teacher, stand up and shout hi. Hi. Hi to you, too. And if you are someone I have not listed here, including a professional development specialist, someone who works at Ohio ETAC, please stand and shout, oh. oh. Great. Let's all shout for a great on the count of three. ETAC Ohio. One, two, three. ETAC Ohio. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So whatever role you have in education, I think it's a great time to be a teacher, technology coordinator, professional development specialist, uh, educator of any kind, because there's really strong leadership pushing toward the future, as we saw evidenced by Mr. Stanford and what Ohio is doing for education. And government support for innovation in the form of great conferences like Ohio eTech, or eTech Ohio. And I found the theme of this conference, shaping a path for the 21st century learner, very appropriate. Because ask yourself, who shaped my path? Your parents, your friends, what about your teachers? Every one of you can shape your student's path. And this is why we are here today. So in order to best shape paths for the 21st century learner, we need to realize what sets 21st century students apart as Mr. Stanford talked about. I was hearing a speech and I was like, okay, let's see, there's one talking point, there's another one <laughs> in there. So I am really glad uh, to have listened to that uh, speech. And in order to best shape paths for a 21st century learner, you have to think, how are my students different from me when I was learning? You might wonder, why can't we just use the same tools that I did when I was learning well, I wanted to share with you a tale of two paths. There's an old path and there's the new path that we must forge. Now you might wonder why can't we continue to pay the same paths as we did when you were learning a hundred years ago. After all, some of our preps, oh no, I didn't mean you were learning a hundred years ago. That was not what I meant. I mean, I know you guys were like in the thousands of years ago. I, I know my dates. Um, some of our greatest presidents, actually the guy on the left is Rutherford B. Hayes. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of him, but he, he was a great president, I'm sure. So some of our greatest presidents came out of an old school approach. A lot of great artists and thinkers came out of that path. So why not hold on to a good road? But keep in mind that back in the 1700s, 1800s, even early 1900s, countries are more isolationist than they are today. International connections were only just beginning to develop. So the old school road is anything but a good road. Kids don't want to walk on it because it's crumbling under the weight of new challenges. Old colonies are now competitors, and international connections stretch from Bangladesh to Belgium through the information superhighway. Speaking of Bangladesh and Belgium, you may have heard complaints about outsourcing, the process of sending jobs to countries where they can be done for cheaper and some say better. Manufacturing in China, calling centers in India, the list goes on and on. So have any of you seen the Did You Know videos? Raise your hand if you've seen the Did You Know videos. Maybe a lot of you have seen those, and they have these really startling statistics going by in rapid order, along with pretty dramatic music. And so one of the ones that I really noted was the part of India's population, the 25% of India's population with the highest IQs, is greater than the total population of the United States. Then it was followed by translation. India has more honors kids than America has kids. And I thought that that was really startling. 
Now, that might not have been something we noticed 100 years ago, 200 years ago. It might not have been true 100 or 200 years ago. But because of global connections, because of our trade and our communication with countries like India, then companies based in the US are not always looking inward for workers. They're looking out. The playing field has been expanded from one city. Oops, is this going past? OK, the playing field has been expanded from one city, one state, or one country to include almost every inhabited nation on Earth. But what's the point of education? Is it just to create workers and churn people out to put them in the workforce? No, it doesn't just create job-ready students. It also creates contributing citizens who must contribute to their nation and to their world to solve the problems uh, that are problems around the globe. So 21st century students are facing more severe and direct challenges than many who have come before. There's cyber warfare and conflict and extremism and climate change. It's a lot on anyone's plate, and it weighs even more if you're not prepared. So we must solve today's problems by creating students who will be able to innovate for the next day and solve the questions that do not even yet exist. Technology pushes us to defy boundaries and encourages us to pioneer. And it helps unleash our creativity and imagination. So have any of you watched the movie Avatar? Raise your hand if you've watched the movie Avatar. I have not yet, although everybody is telling me to. So that is an example of where technology is used to great effect, to create an interesting and moving storyline and an interesting and moving movie. The iPhone's existence pushes people to make creative applications. So I cite the app Atomic Fart as a great example of this. Now, when you were, say, five years old, did you know exactly what you wanted to be when you grew up? Raise your hand if when you were five years old you knew what you wanted to be when you grew up. And are you what you wanted to be at five now? I see some nods, but the majority of the audience, it looks like, did not know exactly what they wanted to be at five. So at five, I wanted to be an architect until I found out that being an architect involved math, at which point it was another story. At six, I was going through the kind of princess ballerina stage until I learned that the first involved marriage and the second involved a lot of hard work, both of which I found really distasteful at the time. And at some point, I think I even wanted to be president. I certainly don't now. If, if you see the graying hair, that's not something that looks great on me. It wasn't until I was seven or eight that I had a more solid idea of what I wanted to be. Well, solid, you heard what it was. <laughs> but who knows, I might add some more to that. I might shave some more off. I might become a lawyer or a doctor, maybe even an architect, or all of the above. Like yesterday's students, today's students have many different career options ahead of them. but the career options are a little different. So the world has gone through periods of rapid change in recent history. Farmers have become city dwellers, and the assembly line has spread up production on so many different fronts. Professions have been adding up steadily, too. Who worked in forensic accounting 100 years ago? I'm not even sure what forensic accounting is. I read an article on MSN in which one person they quoted was a menu psychologist menu psychologist. That is like a dream job. <laughs> and what little boy or girl told their parents 100 years ago that they wanted to work in green funeral directing? Actually, I'm not sure that green funeral directing is a dream job today either. But with the revolution of technology over the past 50 years, new jobs have been adding up. Uh, and many job titles which are commonplace have gone out of existence. Who heard of a chandler anymore? They apparently make candles. And job titles which were not in existence a few years ago have become commonplace. I never heard of a technology coordinator in the 1800s, or really early 1900s for that matter. It's no longer so much about choosing one path and staying on it. The 21st century student's pathway is forked in many different directions. In fact, the US Department of Labor estimates that today's learner will have 10 to 14 jobs by the age of 38. 10 to 14 jobs. In the olden days, you would graduate from high school or college, get a job, and stay with it until you retired. Today, a more competitive and volatile economy means that students may be retiring later. It means that they may not be able to do the same jobs that their parents and grandparents have done. And it means that they will have to maybe have many different jobs over a lifetime. The world and its needs are constantly changing. And the ability to solve those problems means 
the ability to learn new skills and the ability to learn and relearn. Not only do we need to give our students knowledge about the past, we need to give them the knowledge to help them innovate for the future. And we have to make them flexible and give them the confidence to learn anything. The challenges that new technology provides in the classroom, you know what I'm talking about, the challenges that new technology provides in the classroom, but that gives students practice in learning new skill sets and finding new innovative ways to use technology that they might have previously used for just gaming. When you were growing up, did you know how to podcast? Anybody? Okay, post a video to YouTube, blog, tweet. I hear you saying, well, that didn't exist when I was growing up. Ah, excuses, excuses. The truth is that when it comes to technology, you and your youth and your parents and your grandparents were mere pedestrians on the road of technology. Today's ride in limousines. With new technologies like iPods, video conference, and cell phones, the internet, students live in a world that is increasingly technology driven. So 30 years ago, could you have predicted that tweet would become common usage and friend would become a verb, as in I friended someone on Facebook? Whether we like it or not, technology is an inerasable part of every student's life. So in order to understand 21st century students' needs, teachers have to keep up with their students. And don't be afraid to hitchhike and catch a ride along that technology limousine. So today, you may use those technological tools that you never thought possible when you were little. Well, today's students, too, will be using technology throughout their adult careers. And if you thought the pace of technology developing was fast now, I think it's going to get faster. And so if we believe that school is preparation for the real world, how many of you school is preparation for the real world? Raise your hand. I see a lot of raised hands. School prepares kids to go out, get jobs, be contributing citizens, if the school's preparation for life, then we should integrate technology into student careers. If schools ignore technology and in turn the real world, then their role gets diminished. And that is something that none of us want to see. Although that may answer the question of why innovate, why bring technology into the classroom, it doesn't entirely answer the question of what. What are the qualities you want to see in 21st century students? So I'm a big fan of alliteration. As any language arts teachers here probably know, alliteration is where you use the first letter of a word and you uh, use a bunch of words to begin with that sentence. So I think that some student qualities that are important are confidence in the face of change and competition, the capability to learn new skills, comfortableness with uncertainty. In other words, the three C's. So I think that these are important because the world is continually changing. It's not stagnant, the pace of change is really fluid, and it's always moving. So these three are very important. In order to reach those goals, students should be able to effectively communicate and collaborate and create, which happens to rhyme. And yes, the three C's have reappeared. All right, so we know that we want students to communicate, collaborate, yada, yada, yada. This vision is very fine and dandy, except that it's still just that, a vision. And in order to make visions a reality, you have to ask yourself, how? Certainly, we have many challenging roadblocks when it comes to opening doors to student achievement. There are battles and mountains and rivers in our way. But as the sound of music's mother, Abbas, memorably sang, my dad.